as, as Chancellor of the University, I shall now proceed with the conferment of an honorary degree. Would Robert Lawrence Cameron please come forward? The Vice-Chancellor, Professor Pat Walsh, will read the citation. Chancellor, Robert Lawrence Cameron is a leader in the New Zealand business world and one of this country's most accomplished investment bankers. He has influenced national microeconomic policies and managed some of New Zealand's largest organisational transactions during his distinguished career. Rob Cameron received a Bachelor of Commerce and Administration from Victoria University in 1971 and began his career in the Department of Trade and Industry. In 1974, he returned to Victoria to complete a first-class honours degree in economics, before serving as private secretary to the Honourable Joe Walding and subsequently the Right Honourable Sir Brian Tallboys, providing them with advice on overseas trade and national development issues. While working in the Internal Economics Division of the Treasury, he was awarded a prestigious Harkness Fellowship to Harvard University, where he gained a Master of Public Administration in Economics. During his time there, Rob Cameron was also invited to the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. as a guest scholar. On his return to New Zealand, Rob Cameron rejoined the Treasury as a section head in the Economics Division. He was a principal architect in the development of the state-owned enterprise model during the early 1980s, before taking up the role of Director of Research at Jardin and Company. During this time, Rob Cameron became one of the financial sector's leading analysts he went on to lead the investment banking division at Fay Richwhite and Company, advising on some of New Zealand's largest capital market transactions. In 1995, he established Cameron Partners Limited, now one of New Zealand's foremost independent investment banks. Throughout his career, Rob Cameron has continued to engage with public sector issues and advise governments, and in 2008 was appointed chair of the Capital Markets Development Task Force. A series of recommendations from the task force resulted in major policy changes affecting New Zealand's capital markets. Rob Cameron has supported not-for-profit organisations, including serving as a member of the Board of Trustees of Special Olympics New Zealand. He is currently a director on the Board of Kia, which encourages expatriate New Zealanders and friends of New Zealand to increase their contribution to the country. He has also continued to provide knowledge and support to his alma mater, Victoria University, through such roles as Chair of the New Zealand Institute for the Study of Competition and Regulation, and as a long-serving member of the advisory boards for the Faculty of Commerce and Administration and the School of Government. He was a member and treasurer of the University Council between 1998 and 2001, and his support for Victoria was recognised in 2003 when he received a Hunter Fellowship. Rob Cameron's economic and financial expertise has seen him receive a number of accolades, including being made a Life Fellow of the Institute of Finance Professionals of New Zealand. He is a business leader who has made significant and influential contributions to both private and public sectors in New Zealand, and for many years has been a critically important contributor to the growth and governance of Victoria University. Chancellor, I have the honour to present to you Robert Lawrence Cameron, Bachelor of Commerce and Administration with First Class Honours, Master of Public Administration in Harvard University, Fellow of the Institute of Finance Professionals of New Zealand, for the degree of Doctor of Commerce, honoris causa, in this university. By the authority of Victoria University of Wellington, I, Ian McKinnon, Chancellor, now confer on Robert Lawrence Cameron the degree of Doctor of Commerce, honoris causa.
Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, Council members, university staff, graduates, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> my sincere thanks to Victoria University for the award of my degree, the first research university in New Zealand, by a couple of lengths, I hear. I am deeply honoured to accept it. <coughs> graduates, congratulations. This is your day, as it turns out mine too. I extend congratulations and thanks to all those friends and family who supported you through your study. My task today is to provide you some words of wisdom before you step out into the world as new graduates. I intend to keep it brief. We're all keen for you to take your first step. The web gives you access to many excellent and inspiring graduation addresses. Steve Jobs' address to Stanford University commencement ceremony in 2005 is a standout. His message was this, follow your heart and your intuition, accept the inevitable trials and disappointments you'll encounter in life, keep moving forward and trust that the dots will connect. Ellen DeGeneres' address to graduating students at the University of Tulane's 2009 commencement address was clever very funny and extremely entertaining. Early in a speech, she gazes over the audience and says, and I'll paraphrase this, look at all of us here in our robes. Usually when you see somebody wearing a robe in the afternoon, it means they've given up. <laughs> and this was her closing message. Follow your pas passion, stay true to yourself, never follow someone else's path, Unless you're in the woods and you're lost and you see a path, then by all means follow that. <laughs> in general, these addresses include some or more of the following themes. Follow your dreams or passion, take risks, accept and move on from the trials and disappointments you face in life and success will follow. They are inspiring, but they don't really tell us what made these people successful. There are graduates here today who want to be and will be our future leaders with an ambition to be a game changer. A Ralph Norris of the banking industry, an entrepreneur like Rod Drury, a corporate leader like Joan Withers, or even a leader whose changes are having a global impact like Marissa Meyer at Yahoo, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, or Sheryl Sandberg at, um, at Facebook. That should be your passion. So what I'll talk about are the characteristics that have enabled leaders and game changers to beat their paths to success. What I've observed leads me to believe that all these people p possess three signature strengths. Curiosity, an open mind, and optimism. When these strengths are combined with a developed and in your case trained intellect, they significantly raise the chances that success in some field will follow. Now, let me talk about each. Curiosity about the world opens people to new experience and insights that fall outside the existing knowledge and preconceptions. Martin Seligman, a leader in the field of positive psychology, observes that curious people do not simply tolerate ambiguity. They like it and are intrigued by it. Curiosity is the enemy of boredom and intolerance and a friend of interest and awareness. It protects you from being a prisoner of your subconscious. It, does, it drives the desire to learn the thirst for knowledge, even in the absence of external incentives. It involves novel and complex experiences and observations and therefore requires attention and produces inquisitive thinking. It is a driving force behind scientific research in all fields of human study. We have it at birth, but often neglected as we, grow, as we grow up. To quote Albert Einstein, the important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. Open-mindedness involves receptiveness to new ideas and the views of others. Open-minded people hold views, but know that their views do not have to be held by everyone. They also know their views can be wrong. They think things through. They pause and reflect. They're prepared to change their mind. And they're much less vulnerable to the typical decision-making biases that you will see 
from time to time people making throughout your careers, anchoring, relying too heavily on a past point of reference, confirmation bias, selecting or interpreting data that confirms your preconceptions, status quo bias, an irrational preference for things as they are, and hindsight bias, a tendency to think things are more predictable than they really are. Open-minded people listen, and generally they get better at it as they get older. Unfortunately, their hearing, like mine, often deteriorates at the same time, but you can't have it all. <coughs> Steve jo Jobs urged his audience to not be trapped by dogma, which is a result of other people's thinking. An open mind insulates us from dogma. Open-minded people elevate themselves above partisan politics. They know any government in a functioning democracy can make good and bad decisions. <coughs> For example, the previous Labor government appointed me chair of the Capital Markets Development Task Force and let the task force write its own terms of reference. The subsequent national government accepted those recommendations and is now, and is now implementing them all. Uh, possibly two of the most inspired decisions either of those governments have made. <laughs> but I'm keeping an open mind on that issue. <laughs> Optimism is actually less a signature strength than a way of looking at the future. Optimistic people display positive emotions about the future, faith, trust, confidence, hope. And psychologists have studied optimism and hope extensively and now understand them quite well. Among other things, they've been shown to produce better performance at work, resistance to depression, and emotional resilience when bad times strike. Now, I'm not saying that optimists are good and pessimists are bad. It's simply that each approaches the world differently. It turns out optimists prepare to think about advancing and growing. Pessimists tend to think about safety and security. And for this reason, pessimists are well suited to roles involving identifying, avoiding, and managing risks, and they're often sought out for these skills. But it is the optimist who is likely to be a leader when it comes to uncovering and pursuing new opportunities and growing businesses or organizations. Winston Churchill put it succinctly, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, and an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. My contention is that any one of these strengths Curiosity, open-mindedness, or optimism is by itself not enough to make a great leader a game changer. It is the combination of all three. A person who is an optimist but does not possess curiosity in an open mind is at risk of making biased over optimistic decisions, failing to learn from mistakes, and refusing to change direction when the evidence suggests otherwise. A person who's curious and open-minded but does not see a world full of hope and opportunity may not have the enthusiasm to lead change and inspire others to follow. The combination of these strengths produces imagination, innovation, creativity, adaptability, and enthusiasm. They enable people who possess them to identify choices others cannot, to envisage new products, services, and markets that don't yet exist, to chase other opportunities others wouldn't dare, some can even foresee our needs before we even recognize them as wants. Steve Jobs is a good example. I can't live without that. Their open-mindedness also tells them they cannot do it alone. They gather great teams around them. Generally, people with this combination of strengths are great to work with. They inspire others. Teams led by these people tend to develop a culture that reflects their strengths, a premium on learning, a willingness to listen to the views of others, a positive approach to problem solving. And sometimes, circumstances can spontaneously produce teams of these strengths. Early in 2001, Cameron Partners was asked to provide advice to the Treasury on the proposed recapitalization of Air New Zealand. It became one of New Zealand's most complex and challenging corporate restructuring exercises. Air New Zealand at the time was facing a combination of huge industry changes, a fast changing market, and a corporate strategy that was designed for different circumstances. It was in crisis. And in the middle of this crisis, the September 11 terrorist attacks occurred. The outlook for the airline industry changed overnight for the worse. The major shareholders decided they could not support the company through the transition to viability, 
Air New Zealand was facing impending disaster. If the creditors lost confidence, it was game over. Looking back, there are three observations that emerged for me from that experience. The first is that the recapitalization and rescue of Air New Zealand could not have succeeded without a team that had the optimism, optimism to believe we could salvage the airline when others did not. I was curious to learn what we did not know about Air New Zealand and the industry rather than rely on what we did. We're open-minded enough to explore new potential business models and solutions to the crisis. And that team comprised a small subset of the board, ministers, advisors, one or two bankers, and a few key members of the management team. The second observation was it showed that key and timely insights come from unexpected sources. I left for, <coughs> for what was meant to be two days of negotiations and arrived back home two weeks later. And my wife suggested we go for a walk along Patoni Beach and I'd tell her what had been happening. And as I walked with her, I'd talk to her in, uh, about the excitement and the pressures and then the frustrations and particularly this frustration that we were moving towards having to provide a rescue package where the government was going to put in all the capital, take all the risk, and was not going to have control. And we just didn't know how to deal with that. And Maureen looked at me and just said, but that's your answer. And it was. It turned out, it turned into a controlled transaction. And that, from that night, we had a conference call with Michael Cullen and it became the basis of the rescue package going forward. Thanks, Maureen. Third, it highlighted the importance of timely humour. Early on in the process, we had to brief the committee of ministers that had been established for the purposes of, the pack of um, assisting Air New Zealand with the possible outcomes. And it turns out that the financial structures of airlines are complex, but it means that bad things can happen when you don't expect them. And we had to brief the ministers and told them about they want to know likely outcomes, but particularly downsides. And some of the downsides were that we were, that the airline would close. The, airline, the planes couldn't fly because the secured creditors would, would, um, uh, would advance their security and we'd have no airline working. And one of the senior ministers got up and he looked around the room and he said, do you understand what this means? Two weeks from now, we might not have a national airline. And there was dead silence in the room, and he turned to my partner, Murdo Beatty, and myself, Murdo is now a managing partner, and looked at us and said, so what do we do? Well, we weren't in any position at the stage to have a recommendation, but in that dead silence, it was clear that something was needed. And my partner, Murdo, looked up from his notes, and he looked directly at the minister and said, well, if I was you, I would suggest a block booking on the Northern Passenger Rail Service. And what that did was change the dynamics of the game. It actually, the humor became an important part of the way the team worked. And what I want to say about that is good leaders and teams which exhibit the signature strengths that I've outlined actually understand the importance of humor and fun. Let me sum up by saying I'm not proposing a new general theory of successful leadership. My academic friends would never let me get away with that. But I am saying that if you wish to be a leader and a game changer, then develop your curiosity, cultivate an open mind, and hold on to your optimism. These signature strengths are worthwhile for their own, their own sake. Even if you do not become a leader and a game changer, you'll be a better and more interesting person. And I hope I provided a few more insights than the uh, than the character in Dilbert did in this morning's comic strip. He'd been studying a book on management uh, to look at what leaders have in common, and he decided the key factor they all shared was that they were carbon-based life forms. <laughs> so finally, while researching my address, I learned an important fact. Graduates, you will never have more energy, enthusiasm, hair, or brain cells than you have today. So with that knowledge, 
As you start on your journey as a graduate, beginning with the short walk to this stage, I ask each of you to consider the momentum you have gained from your studies to never stop learning, keep an open mind, be inspired and inspire others, and along the way, have fun. Graduates, ladies and gentlemen, thank you.